In this session, we're going to talk about Christians being persecuted for 2,000 years, starting in Jerusalem in 33 AD. Jesus said in Luke 21, 9, there's going to be wars and earthquakes and famines and plagues. The end is not yet. The second coming is not yet. Jesus is talking about his second return. All right. And before all the wars come and the earthquakes come and the famines and the plagues and the fearful sights and great signs from heaven. Now, great signs from heaven is supernatural signs. It's not like this blood moon tonight. That is a natural phenomenon. When God starts moving in the heaven and the stars fall from heaven and the heavens roll back like a scroll and all these catastrophic things that are going to come up on the earth before Christ comes, that's all going to be supernatural, no scientific explanation. You understand that? Yes. yes. So don't get fooled by that stuff. God's going to display himself before he comes. All right? So before all of these wars and, and before the end of the time and all that and the sights from heaven, they're going to persecute in prison and bring you before civil and synagogue rulers. Okay, before any of this happens, they're going to persecute you. He's talking to his apostles and his followers. Family and friends are going to betray you. And we're in a big generation where family turns against their parents. Even parents that brought them up right, kids, turn against them. They got no reason to fame that parent, and they turn on them and turn against them. <clears throat> when Jerusalem is sieged by armies, you people flee. The apostles flee. Church flee. Its desolation has come. Jerusalem and the temple, Jesus said, are going to be destroyed. In Matthew and Mark, Jesus, the, the writers of those books, use the abomination of desolation. When you see the abomination of desolation, flee. Okay? But Luke just tells us what it is. Luke says when you see armies besieging Jerusalem, you better run because I'm going to destroy Jerusalem and I'm going to destroy the temple. Are you there? So the... De the, the abomination of desolation has already happened, folks. And I know there's a big teaching out there about the seven years of tribulation and how they bring Daniel over into this and all that. But let me tell you, it's done. It's happened, and Jesus plainly said it. Are you with me? Yes. All right. Now, <clears throat> in 2 Timothy 12 and many other scriptures, Everyone who desires to live a godly life in Jesus Christ will be persecuted. You decide to really follow the truth of the Bible. That's going to expose people, and they don't like to be exposed, so they're going to blame you, shame you, mistreat you, <clears throat> and reject you. You understand that? If you don't choose righteousness, they got no problem with you. <laughs> You're not exposing anything. And Jesus said, the time is coming when a man's enemies will be those of what? His own household. Just like he said here, your family and friends are going to betray you. You want to really live a righteous life, they're going to disagree with you and they're going to separate from you. And if you compromise, you're enabling them. Now, so, Persecuted by friends and family, persecuted by civil and synagogue, religious rulers, and even armies. There have been wars against Christians. <clears throat> so, we go to the book of Acts to find out if Jesus told us the truth. In Acts 4, the apostles were jailed. They immediately, when Jesus ascended into heaven, they immediately went out and preached the gospel, and immediately they were put in jail, arrested and put in jail. And they were threatened by the, the religious rulers to not to preach Jesus and the resurrection of the dead. Okay? Just like Jesus said, they're going to be persecuted. Then, in Acts chapter 5, they're jailed again. An angel came and liberated them out of prison. And the angel said, go and preach. The angel told them to go and preach. So they're down there in the house of God preaching. 
So they're rearrested and they're beaten this time and they're forbidden to preach in Jesus' name, the name above every name, the name that every knee will bow. They're forbidden to use that name. What name are you forbidden to use in Washington, D.C.? Jesus. You can say God all day long. Because they believe all roads lead to the same God. And you are persecuting those people if you use the name of Jesus. You are singling yourself out. But that's the name above every name. That's the name and that's the person they're going to bow to when he comes. Amen? And we should not cave into that. We should use the name of Jesus because his full name is the Lord Jesus Christ of Nazareth, the Son of the living God. That is his full name. Amen? Yes. We're not talking about some human being saying they're the Messiah. We're talking about the real one. So, you have your first taste of sectarianism. Sectarianism is, if you don't believe the way I believe, I ain't having nothing to do with you. Uh, I'm going to mistreat you. I'm going to persecute you. Uh, I'm going to make you wish you were never born. If you don't agree with me, that's what sectarianism is. And they beat him and put him in prison. That's your first example of sectarianism. The Jews did not like these apostles preaching the new covenant. Did Jesus come and give us a new covenant? Absolutely. He did. They didn't like them. They wanted to stick with the old covenant. How many religious people today want to stick with their old religion? Yeah. Now, then we have in 6 and 7, Stephen is falsely accused of blasphemy against God, against Moses, against the law of Moses, and against Jerusalem, and against the temple. Okay, what did Stephen say that they said he was blaspheming? And they stoned him for preaching Jesus will destroy the Jerusalem and the temple. Isn't that what Jesus said is going to happen? Now, Jesus didn't come down and physically do it. He used the Roman army to do it. Isn't that right? Yes. Yeah. And change Moses' customs, Moses' laws. What laws? Now, you ought to know this by now. The shadow laws. The shadow laws pointed to the truth. The sacrificed lamb pointed to Jesus the lamb. Isn't that right? Circumcision of the male pointed to the circumcision of the heart and the new covenant. All right. The natural temple pointed to the spiritual temple of living stones that God purposed to raise up and build from the foundation of the world. That was his goal. And so Stephen is preaching the truth. And they want to stay with their natural understanding of the Bible. They want to keep these shadow laws. And Stephen is exposing them. So they stoned him. They killed him for preaching what we just read Jesus said. Isn't that right? He just repeated what Jesus said. So in Acts chapter 8 and Acts chapter 11 through Acts chapter 11 verse 19, there was a great persecution against the church in Jerusalem. The persecution was so bad that the church was scattered abroad except the apostles. And it amazes me that God protected the apostles and scattered the church. <laughs> God is an amazing God. He put his hand on the twelve to protect them, and yet he had the church scattered. Why? Because there's a time coming when Rome is going to surround Jerusalem and destroy it. God did not want his church in Jerusalem. Are you there? Yeah. But the apostles, he protected them and they could handle it. They stayed around. Now, we're going to go back to Acts 2.44. All that believe were together. Wouldn't that be nice? Are we together in America? Good God, no. 
We argue over the stupidest things. We, we are... We act like the Bible says, be great debaters. <laughs> Gosh. Yeah. They had all things common. They sold property and possessions to give to anyone in need. All right? None of them lacked in Acts 4.34 and Acts 6.1. For owners of lands and owners of houses sold them Brought them to, brought the price to the apostles who distributed to everyone in need. They sold their investments. Why did they do that? Because they knew these investments was, were going to be worthless. <laughs> and the apostles took the price of the investments the houses, the lands, and so forth. And they distributed it to everyone in need. In Acts 6, we have that method of distribution. It was to the widows and the orphans. And the widow had to be 60 years of age without a family that could support her. We, we have all that. It wasn't everybody. It wasn't the handouts to everybody. And the apostles did not go out and buy Rolls Royce silver shadows and mansions upon the hill and mansions on the lake and, a, and the latest designer clothes and gold necklaces and all that. They did not spend the money and preach, you know, the godliness is prosperity. Are you there? Yeah. They didn't do that. They gave it to what? The orphans and the widows. See, anything above 10% is a free will offering. You decide to do it. You're only commanded to give 10% to get the word of God out, support the ones that are, are getting the word out. That's the 10%. Are you there? Some people say, well, we don't have to give 10% today. Jesus made it very clear. He says, you Pharisees and you Sadducees, you pay tithe of the least little thing, but you omit the weightier matters of the law, love, Justice, judgment, okay, and faith. You ought to do the weightier matters of the law and not leave the other undone. What was the other? The tithe. The tithe is the only area you can prove God in. You can't test God in any area but tithing. Malachi chapter 3 or 5, I forget. You can test him and see if he will not open up the windows of heaven and not only bless you financially, but bless you spiritually. He wants to give you the true riches of the kingdom. And if you can't trust God with 10%, how can you really say you're trusting God with your eternal soul, which is way more valuable? Are you there? So these guys sold this property. Because they knew it was going to be worthless. So I might as well put it to use. And now, this is where the commune movement in the 1960s and 70s and still some of them are beyond came in. This is the scriptures they used. I lived through that. I had to deal with these communes. <clears throat> All right. Some of the more popular ones are Jim Jones, who wound up killing not over 900 people. They drank the Kool-Aid of poison to follow their leader. Good God, folks, we're supposed to be following Christ. Would Christ ever ask us to kill ourselves? No, why? The Ten Commandments, thou shalt not kill. Good grief. You don't have to be a theologian to understand this stuff. Amen? Yes. <clears throat> the D Davidians in Waco, Texas, they died. Why? Because they fathered, followed some guy. And both of these leaders were having sexual uh, intimacy with other women in the congregation. Both of them. And these women were dumb enough to believe this nonsense. God has not given us a spirit of fear, but of power and love and what? A sound mind, folks. Nobody can capture our mind when we are really in Christ. We have a solid thinking mind. Amen? Amen. Now, 
Then you have Shiloh, which was the biggest uh, commune. And it came out of Calvary Chapel. It came out of Calvary Chapel and it was first called Miracle House. The Miracle Houses. And they started, they're halfway houses. The secular people had already started halfway houses in the 50s and the 60s, okay? And so the church always follows the secular. <laughs> Communal living. And uh, uh, Lonnie Frisbee and a couple other guys from Calvary Chapel started it. And they went up to Oregon and bought a lot of property and had a, they had over 100,000 people in communes all over America. All right. And back in those days, music was a big thing. Music concerts and all that. And really, people were worshiping music and not the Lord Jesus Christ. When you got to have a concert to meet with God, you got a problem. You should be able to meet with God in your bedroom, on your knees, seeking Him. Jesus never used music. And music is Bible, don't get me wrong. But it doesn't substitute my personal contact with Christ. If you seek Him, you will find Him. Not the music. So, they had some funny doctrines. But the thing of it is, in communal living, everybody puts the money into the pot. All right? And then, like, they go out and work, and they say, they're, I'm working for free. You ain't working for free. They send groups out, and they, they send them to fish and catch the fish, and then they sell the fish, and the money goes into the pot. Or a cannery, or they buy a business, a, a tree. They had these businesses that they had. Well, the IRS come in and says, whoa, 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 whoa. These aren't donations. This is taxable income. You are operating a business. And Shiloh couldn't pay the back taxes, so they closed up. Are you there? Are we a business church? No. But do we run the church like we're a business? Financially accountable? Yes. But we're not a business. Okay. So here's the, a big group of Shiloh commune people. Then the other one was the children of God. Like Shiloh started in 1968, so did the children of God in Huntington Beach, very close to where I lived at the time. His name was David Berg, and he called it Teens for Christ. Don't that just sound, oh, how, what a beautiful ministry, Teens for Christ, turning teens around, because teens were all mixed up. Why did I bring them up? God changes people. Makes us new creatures. I don't care where you've been and what you've done. He changes us. All right. So anyway, uh, David Berg was a missionary alliance minister. And then he changed the name to the children of God. And he, he used music. Music was the thing back there. I was sitting in the front seat. Yeah. Oh, man, music, music, music. They listened to it all day and then they'd go to concerts and all the rest. And... They weren't changing their life, folks, and they weren't growing in God. And I lived through this. And I had to wade through all this debris in the river of life to keep the river clean. All right? Now, <clears throat> they wore a little yoke around their neck. So after I found out I could spot them anywhere, oh, yeah, I know who you are. All right, and they came into the vine where we had a coffee house from our church and, and all that. And after a service, I saw four of them talking to people. And I go, what is this? And I go, hey! Everybody looks up. I go, who are you? And what are you doing? Who are you and what are you doing? Who are you? What, what's going on here? Oh, we're just sharing Christ with the people. I said, what's your name? Methuselah. I said, what's your name? Hezekiah. Well, what's your name? Zechariah. I said, nobody names their kids like that. Nobody. That was my first encounter with the children of God. 
And I pulled him up front and I said, don't you ever come in here and try to recruit people from a church. You never go into another church and try to recruit people. You do your preaching out on the street. Isn't that right? Yes. Hallelujah. You got a problem with the church, you keep it between yourself and the leaders. You don't go to members and bring your uh, disagreements to them. You keep it with leaderships. You don't have the authority and you don't have the right. And when somebody comes to you to attack in the church, you're supposed to gay, hey, let's go talk to leadership. You're not supposed to listen to them. Am I right? If you have a disagreement, get the guy and go to the ones who have the responsibility. Are you with me? And I have to deal with this stuff. And yes, I'm going to protect the flock. A pastor feeds the flock and protects them. And they got the guts to come in and do that. I got the guts to publicly stand up there and go, hey, who are you? You want to publicly come in here and make a decorate? I'm going to publicly decorate back. <laughs> and Mr. Barnes, me and him have been the watchdogs of the church for years. And our eyes are always open. Even if you're talking to us, our ears and eyes are somewhere else. Uh, <laughs> we want to make sure everything is right. Anyway, I said, you come to my, this church, I'm coming. I found out they were from a commune down in Fullerton. I said, I'm coming down there tomorrow morning. I already had a family that came in, and the children of God had taken the kid and hidden them from the other spouse. And they wanted me to help them get it. That, this happened a lot. You know, then they used, you know, if you don't forsake mother and father and all this. I said, that has nothing to do. You don't take a original parent's child and hide them from that parent. Amen? Amen? You don't use a scripture to do that. They're the responsibility of that parent. So I'm coming down. I went down there at 7 o'clock in the morning the next day. And I knocked on a door and nothing happened. I could hear them in there rustling. <laughs> and I says, I'm going to stand here and knock on this door until you answer. You came up to air meeting and disrupted it I want to talk to the leader here and finally after about an hour of me banging on that door and said I ain't leaving the leader come out and started talking to me he lied to me through his teeth and all the rest and anyway <clears throat> the children of God use flirty evangelism flirty evangelism means church members flirt with unbelievers and offer them sex if they believe in Christ and accept Christ as their Savior. This is it. I mean, I dealt with it. I lived through this. This is what I had to work with in a, being a pastor and a minister in the kingdom. Okay, so David Berg's own wife Use flirty evangelism. She had sex with a guy to get him saved and all that, and she got pregnant. If you get pregnant when you're using flirty evangelism, or flirty fisher as they called it, <laughs> then it's a Jesus baby. Because Jesus, you know, can stop a baby from being born, or he can make a baby being born. So if, you, if, if, if a baby was born, and are you seeing how stupid this stuff is? Yeah, okay, this is dumb. This is just totally stupid. And so they called it a Jesus baby. So they had a lot of Jesus babies, all right? David Burke and his wife took this boy who was born, and at four years old, they started having sex with this boy. That's incest. And they taught their people that you could have incest, and guess who they used? Jacob. He married Rachel, then he married Rachel's sister, then he had sex with Rachel's midwife, ma maiden, and Rachel's maiden, both of them. So see, they just said, you, God wants us to love one another, and that includes sex. So they're just over there having a, a great orgy. <laughs> All right? Now, these are facts. Okay? So... 
They went out and they would donate. They, they would ask businessmen and all that to donate to the commune. We're trying, you know, getting people off drugs and, and you know, it's, it's uh, you know, teens for Christ. Oh, yeah. And the businessmen, without checking, how many know the Bible says, know those that labor among you? Yes. Yeah, you're supposed to check them out. What kind of life are they living? <laughs> you don't just blindly follow people. And when you go to a big church, how can you find out and know how that person is living unless somebody exposes them? Like the, uh, what's that Australian church? Hillsong. Hillsong. The Hillsong Church in New York is just, you know, they drink, they, they allow their people to have, it, it's, it's not healthy. It's very permissive. And news media comes in, checks it out, and exposes it, but then the people just protect them. Are you there? <laughs> Are you listening to the word? Yes. yes. Now, that made Berg very rich. They go out and they beg for donations and ask businessmen to go donations, and they put it into the pot. And they support the people there and the excess goes to Berg. And he's a rich man. So was Jim Jones. Are you there? The wife of the leaders of Shiloh divorced them. Do you know why? They didn't want to raise their family in a commune with hundreds of people. Does that sound logical? And the husbands would not turn. We've got to reach these people. And so to protect their children, the women were wiser than the men. And women couldn't preach in a Calvary Chapel, you know. And these, uh, you know, women are just, shut up. <laughs> just listen to us men who never seek God. <laughs> so that's the children of God. And these are the things that I had to work with. Know those who labor among you. Now, daily in the temple, Acts 5, and house to house they teach and preach Jesus Christ. Where do they go? House to house, not commune to commune. Are you there? Not one big commune in Jerusalem. They were still had their primary house. They sold other houses, they sold other lands, they sold other investments, but they still had their primary house. Amen? And when you showed it to them back then, they wouldn't listen. Why? They, they, so-and-so, Reverend so-and-so said, yeah, I don't care what Reverend so-and-so said, Jesus Christ said. And you got to follow him. Amen? <clears throat> now, Saul began to destroy the church, going from house to what? House, not commune to commune. House to house. They were still alone in the house. And they're, they're dragged, they were drug out of their house, husbands and wives, men and women, and put them in prison. The primary homes they still lived in. Are you there? Do you understand? Communal living is not biblical living from the time that Adam was created until Jesus comes back. We don't live in communes. But the early church was a wise church. You see, they knew these properties were worthless because of what Jesus said. They believed the prophecy. And then when the persecution came early and they had to run, they could sell their house take the money, go somewhere, and start all over again. Are you there? <laughs> That's the real story behind all that. It's not communal even. They were in unity. <clears throat> and part of that unity was helping the widows and the orphans, and that's above the ties, and these people brought it in to help people who lacked. In the church, not out. With rules. Not just anybody. Amen? <clears throat> if any provide not for his own, especially for those of his own household, he had denied the faith 
and is worse than an infidel. Historical persecutions of Christians. I've gone over this in detail with you. You can go back and get it out of the library. The Roman Empire persecuted them. The Jews persecuted them. The Muslims, the Hindus, the Buddhas, and other religions persecuted them. The Roman Catholic Church persecuted them through the Inquisition. The Eastern Orthodox Church persecuted those that didn't believe the way they believed. Then the Protestants came along in 1517, and guess what? They, yeah, we got thousands of different groups of Protestants, and they all persecute each other. They're all sectarian. If you don't believe the way I believe, I can't fellowship with you. That is so childish and so stupid <laughs> that everybody's got to agree with you for you to be happy and, 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 and you know, content with life. Are you there? God help you if you're waiting for people to agree with you. <clears throat> Did people agree, disagree with Jesus? Did he still mingle with them? Yes. Did he compromise and do what they did? Yes. No. He didn't change his doctrine, didn't change his standard of conduct, but he mingled with them. All right? Communists came in in 1917 who are atheists, and they persecute and are persecuting now. <clears throat> the governments have persecuted special interest groups such as the homosexual, transgender, bisexual movement, the rainbow the Socialist Party of the USA, you ought to read their platform. They don't like you Christians. I don't care if you're Pentecostal or Baptist or Catholic. They're out to get rid of you, suppress you. You ought to read these platforms. You, you, you need to read up on things. And, of course, the evolutionists, they just mock the church all the time, don't they? And they got some of the people in the church believing in evolution. Oh, God. Whatever happened to Genesis 1? God out of his mind when he wrote Genesis 1, but it's okay over here in the New Testament? Come on, folks. He's God from the beginning to the end. Isn't that right? Yes. <clears throat> now, harmful behavior should be punished, but harmless behavior... You know, if the Catholics want to kneel before an idol, does that hurt anybody? No. No. If they want to burn candles and burn incense, does that hurt anybody? No, it doesn't hurt them financially. It doesn't hurt them physically at all. So why would you want to hurt somebody that's just doing something they believe in, but it doesn't affect anybody else? And we can preach the gospel all the time on radio, TV, and out on the street corner, and we can share the gospel. If they want to hear, they can hear. Isn't that right? But we don't burn like the Protestants did in the 1800s, the Catholic churches down and their houses down and all that. Are you there? Yeah. <clears throat> the Lutherans were persecuted by the Catholic church. The Lutherans persecuted the Baptists. You want to be baptized? Fine. They held them under until they died? Okay, you, you got baptized. And it goes on down the line. One group persecuting, mistreating, attacking the other group. Do we have that today? Yeah, the church is a mess. It's called sectarianism. If you don't believe what I believe. I want to show you the promise of one united, mature, deliverance church before Christ comes. Your watchmen shall see what? Eye to eye when the Lord shall bring again Zion. Again. He brought Zion, the church, the first time. He's coming back to move in the church again. And guess what? The nations will see the salvation of God. God's always out to reach the nations, to save them, not to debate with them. We, we think we win because we debated with an atheist who isn't changing. Oh, I won that debate. He didn't win anything. He's still an atheist. Are you there? But God says, the watchmen, the church leaders are going to see eye to eye. Can God fulfill that? Yes. Has he fulfilled it? Yes. No, no way. Through history, you never see that. Okay, then in Ephesians 4, keep the unity of what? The Spirit. Does the Spirit and the Word agree? Yes. Does Jesus and the Father agree? Yes. Uh, yeah, they're all in agreement. What is our problem? 
This is a spiritual unity. It's not a fleshly unity. And then he says, there is one body and the, one church. The body is the church. Okay, one spirit, one hope, one Lord, one Messiah, one faith. How many faith? One. one. We got thousands of, our, of, of articles of faith in America that are different. We got one God, one word, and we got thousands of faith. And how many faiths are there? One. one. Is there something wrong? Absolutely. One baptism, one God, and Father of all. And remember, Jesus said, my word is spirit. And the spirit and the word are great. Then he goes on in Ephesians and he says, he gave apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, and teachers for us to idolize and look up to, to equip the saints. Okay? Peter said the, the word of God, the revelation of the word equips the saints. How many want to be equipped? Yes. You go to war, do you want to be equipped and trained in how to use the guns? And the, Yeah. You got to be equipped. You're not going to win the war out there. I believe we're going to win. I believe we're going to win. Here come the tanks and, and the airplane. Bomb, bomb, bomb. Oh, we're going to... And they're all blown to bits. You better be equipped. And how are you going to get equipped if you don't get into a church and grow with it and be taught the equipment of God? Now, till we all come to the what? Unity. Unity of the faith. Have we? Did the early church? Yes, we showed you they had all things in common. They weren't arguing back there with each other. The church in Jerusalem, not churches in Jerusalem. The church in Jerusalem. Never says churches in Jerusalem. Are you there? See, the early church was a wise church. It was a united church. And they attained these promises at the beginning. And then, when the apostles died, it slowly turned into a human mess. Are you with me? But the house, the last day house, will be what? Greater than the former. So there's a time coming, folks, where the church of the living God is going to be powerful like the early church and beyond the early church. Till we all come to the knowledge of the Son of God. How many of you know the Bible says Jesus opened their understanding to understand the Scriptures? Isn't that right? After they preached the gospel for three and a half years, then Jesus came along and opened their understanding. You're not going to get your understanding open unless He opens it. And you're not going to get it open unless you read the Bible and get into a church and get into Bible studies and get on your knees. He is a rewarder of them that what? Diligently work hard at seeking him. Put some work into it. That song we sang, let's take time. That's our problem. We don't take time to worship and seek him. And then we wonder why we lack. <clears throat> Unto a what? Perfect man. A complete man. Is the best Jesus can do is save us and keep us babies? Is that the, all the power he's got? No. We can become a mature person. Unto the measure. This, this is the maturity. This is the completeness he wants us to come to. To the measure, the standard of the stature, the maturity of Christ. There was no sin in him. And what is the church doing all the time? Justifying our sin. Well, we're not perfect. We're not Jesus. The very thing that God, through Paul, prophesied to happen, they rejected. We can come to the stature and the maturity of Jesus Christ in the area of righteousness, not in the area where we can create things. And He's God. He's the creator. But we can treat our wives right and our husbands right and our children right and our parents right. We can do this stuff and we can stay away from sin and darkness and flee the appearance of evil. Isn't that right? Hallelujah. Isn't this good? Now, is this got to be fulfilled? Absolutely. Every jot and tittle of the word must be fulfilled before Christ comes back. 
unto the measure and the stature of Christ, not children tossed to and fro by every wind of doctrine. Remember, Jesus prayed, Father, make them one as you and I are one. Is God going to reject that prayer? The prayers of a righteous man availeth what? Much. Was Jesus a righteous man? Dumb question. <laughs> yes. Is God going to answer his prayer? Yeah. Has he answered it yet? Only in a short period in the early church. Is he going to fulfill it, folks? Absolutely. Do we have something great to look forward to? Yes. Absolutely. And can we attain it now? Was Paul Warren born out of due time? Can we be born out of due time? Get the knowledge and experience it? Yes, we can. We don't have to wait for the next uh, great awakening. Now, a Christians, they're tossed about by every wind of doctrine. They believe in evolution. How stupid is that? How can you be a Christian and believe in evolution? That undermines the power of God. You're saying God was not capable of creating the earth in six days. That's what you're saying. He got a line up to the evolutionists. Are you there? They believe in aborting babies in the womb. They believe in same-sex marriage and same-sex behavior. They put rainbow flags out on their church. It's, um, I, I do a lot of research. It's just amazing what churches are trying to do to appease the, the, the time they're living in, just like back there, they tried to do what the secular world was doing with communes. Just brought it right into the church. Music right into the church. The hippies were drugged up on drugs and music. And so they bring the world right into the church, and then the church, because they want uh, seats filled or whatever, they, they, they undermine the truths of God's word to accommodate them. Are you with me? And we're doing the same thing today. All roads lead to the same God. President Bush said it. President Obama said it. All roads. I got videos of them. All roads lead to the same God. Our leaders, our our the head leader of our nation believed that the Muslims and the Buddhists and the Hindus and the animists are all going to heaven. Well, if that's true, why did Christ die? <laughs> what was the point of his death? There's no point. You can just dream up any old religion you want and go to heaven. Amen. <laughs> God did it before. In Nehemiah, the wall was finished because the people had a mind to work. In Judges 20, all Israel stood together as one man to punish the rapist and the murderer of an Israelite woman. Churches aren't standing up for capital punishment. Churches aren't standing up for anything. They just go to church. Only 25% go to church, by the way. That's how much we love God. Unto him shall the gathering of the people be. Well, we don't gather. Are you there? We just do our thing. All that's going to change. The power of God was upon the people, giving the people one heart to obey the king's commandment from the word of God. The power of God upon the people. Did you hear that? It's not just ministers, the power of God, the hand of God upon the people, giving them what? One heart, one mind, one purpose to get a job done. And they were going to keep the Passover, who Jesus was. It was the shadow of Jesus. Passover, sacrifice for us to protect us from the devourer. <clears throat> Unleavened bread is the righteousness and the first fruits are two things. It is the harvest and it is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, kindness, meekness, faith, and temperance, the fruit of the Spirit. How many could use the fruits of the Spirit? Absolutely. God stirred up the spirit of Cyrus, a heathen king that did not know God. God stirred up the Jewish leaders and the Jewish people to give money, to give what? 10%, anything over 10% is what? 
a free will offering for a purpose that you may want to help in. But the 10% goes to the building of the church through the Word of God. Are you there? Now, <clears throat> the house of the Lord. And to fulfill the word of God by Jeremiah the prophet who prophesied that in 70 years Israel was going to come back and build God's house. So if God stirred up the people, put his power on the people and on the leaders to fulfill Jeremiah's prophet, prophecy, can he do the same thing before Christ comes in the church to stir up his people, empower his people to win souls and to bring the church into maturity. Joel chapter 2, the day of the Lord comes. What day? Day of the Lord. A great people and strong. What kind of people? Not wimps. Not unlearned. A great people and strong. His great army shall march like what? Mighty men. Of what? War. We're fighting against the gates of hell. Isn't that right? Hallelujah. They can't stand against us, but we got to go to war. And what is our weapon? The Word of God. And they won't break ranks. I'm always telling Mr. Barnes, everybody in America should have to go to the military for at least a year. The military disciplines you. Shows you how to work in unity and how to protect the one next to you. His life is vital <clears throat> because you're there protecting him. You, as one group, you can make it through here. You can win this battle. Anybody takes a vacation or turns back, then you endanger the whole group. Are you there? You need to, we need to learn discipline. We need to learn how to follow leaders. <clears throat> Neither shall one wound a brother. Uh, wouldn't that be nice? <laughs> now this is a prophecy of Joel. Alright? <clears throat> then he says, Give not your heritage to reproach. He prayed this prayer. That the heathen should rule over them. He prayed this prayer. Don't give your heritage. Who <clears throat> gets the inheritance of God? The church. The church. We are inherit. We get God's inheritance. We are God's heritage to receive his uh, possession. And he already died on the cross. You see, a will is initiated at the death of the person. Jesus died on the cross, so now we are what? Heirs of these promises. Is that clear? Yes. Now, that the heathen should rule over them. In Deuteronomy 28, 13 and Deuteronomy 15, 6, God says, if you obey my word and follow me, I'll make you the head and not the tail. You will rule over the nations. The nations will not rule over you. Has that prophecy ever been fulfilled? No. The Jews never ruled over the nations. They were always suppressed by the nations. We have been suppressed by the nations. The early church was suppressed by the nations. But there comes a time when this prophecy will be fulfilled. God, through his church, empowering his people, we're going to be rulers. Didn't it say, doesn't the Bible say to Abraham, I'm going to bring kings out of your seat? Talking about the church. Rulers, government rulers. Where are those prophecies? Everybody's saying, that, no, don't get involved in politics. You know, that's of the devil. You know, the Bible doesn't say politics is of the devil. We conjure this nonsense up. We do. That's got to be fulfilled. Civil leaders have to start coming out of the church. I mean real Christian righteous leaders that stand for right. Amen? Powerful. It shall come to pass when? In the last days, the day of the Lord, that I will pour out my spirit on all flesh. Your sons and daughters shall prophesy. Your old man dream, dream. Your young men see visions. I will show wonders in the heavens, the earth, blood, fire, pillars of smoke. The sun shall be turned to darkness, the moon to blood, before the great and terrible day of the Lord. What day? The last days, the day of the Lord. He did this in the early church. 
But I'm going to show you he's also talking about his second return. Just hang on with me. This has not happened. The sun, the moon turned to darkness, uh, dark, sun to darkness, the moon to blood, and all these catastrophic events, the waves roaring in the sea and all this stuff. <clears throat> you know, the heavens rolled away and the stars falling from heaven. That hasn't happened yet. Jesus brought this part of the prophecy into his end time instruction to the apostles, didn't he? Matthew 24, Luke, and Matt, uh, uh, Mark. He brought it in. It shall come to pass that whosoever shall call in the name of the Lord shall be saved for in what? Mount Zion, as we showed you last week and we keep showing you. It's the church. Zion's the church. Jerusalem is <clears throat> the heavenly Jews that come down as a bride adorned for her husband. It's the church. Shall be deliverance. The deliverance, God's going to use the church to deliver the nations. A great harvest in the last days. Doesn't that sound like something God can do? Yeah. yeah. All right. And the remnant. How many times have we used that word remnant? You see, here it is again. The remnant who the Lord shall call. The remnant are the ones that stayed in the olive tree. <laughs> we found last week. Okay, now. To know, so you know, he's talking also about the second return. He says this in Joel 3, 1. Remember, humans put the chapters in there. But Joel is still talking about the same prophecy. In those days, what days? The great and terrible day of the Lord. <clears throat> the last days, the day of the Lord. In those days, that time. When I bring again, what? Again, the captivity of Judah and Jerusalem, which they were scattered until the times of the Gentiles be fulfilled. In 1948, God restored Israel to its natural place. But he hasn't restored Israel spiritually. Has he? That that's the best God can do is just give them their land and let them win battles against the Muslim? Is that the best he can do? Or did he die for their soul? Did he die for their soul? Yes. Can he win them in the end? Yes. yes. Hallelujah. So he's talking about our time, folks. Israel was restored as a nation. Knowledge has increased. He has brought Restoration, times of revival, times of refreshing, like he said he would do. We are living in that time, and we can live as conquerors in this life. So they mistreat you, and they don't want anything to do with you. Is it best to just keep serving God because we're going to win in the end? Absolutely. Absolutely.